Okay, so let's talk about this gentleman for a moment. His name is Gregor Mendel. You've heard his name. He lived in a country that no longer exists called Moravia. Uh, the city that he lived in uh, is called uh, Brno today, and it's in the Czech Republic. Um, and even though it's in the Czech Republic, he himself spoke German because uh, the people in the cities at that time in that, in that country spoke German. And he wrote in German. And he was a very interesting character because among his many talents, he was a gardener as well as a scientist in a sense, although he wasn't so much a, a professional scientist. You'll notice he's wearing the habit of a monk. He was a monk in the Order of St. Augustine, and even today that particular order uh, is involved in, in advancing science and teaching science, and that's what he was. They ran a school, more or less a high school, and he was a teacher and he taught the science in that school. Uh, he tried to get a PhD, he went down to Vienna, and attempted to get a PhD, and for whatever reason didn't get it, uh, and he stayed his whole life as a science teacher, which probably delayed people understanding and, and taking his work very seriously uh, until after he had died, in fact. But again, his name is Gregor, but that's the name that he took uh, after he uh, took his, his monastic vows. Uh, before that, he was, uh, he was born with the name Johann. So, he was the gardener as well as a school teacher, and the gardener in that time in Moravia was a very important position. The reason is, if you think about it, we're talking about the 1830s in the middle of uh, Europe. There's not supermarkets, there's not grocery stores, there aren't these big stores like that that we have today. And really, these guys have to live off of the uh, garden that they themselves keep. So if you have to live off a garden, who do you choose to be your gardener? You choose the smartest person in the, in the monastery. That's exactly who you choose, and that's what he was. So he, because he was so smart, he didn't just want to be a gardener. He wanted to do experiments, and so he did. He did a number of very exquisite experiments. Interestingly enough, even though he did the experiments very well, extremely carefully, there was not one experiment that he ever did that's, that hadn't already been done. He did nothing new. So his contribution was not a new experiment. His contribution was, was a very bold understanding of what the experimental results actually meant. And he wrote them up in this paper written in German, Versuche über Pflanzenhybriden, which uh, means uh, research in plant hybridization. And his experimental results are as important as the experiment itself. So I want to go through the experiment just like we did before with the Viking uh, experiments. I want to go through those so we understand exactly what's going on. Now, first of all, we have to understand a little bit about plant biology. We have to understand how plants reproduce because that's where he was working. He was working on plants in particular. And here's a picture of a flower, and I want you to know all of these terms and what their functions are. This type of flower is what we call a perfect flower because it has both male and female parts. So this flower is literally both male and female. These structures here, the long skinny things with the yellow uh, blobs at the end, are the male structures. This structure right here in the middle is the female structure. Now the female structure has a, basically a tube with a swelling at the bottom of it. It's a modified leaf. It's actually a leaf. And the swelling at the bottom holds in it a bunch of eggs. And so we call that the ovary. Coming off of the egg is this, uh, the, of the ovary is, a bun, is this long tube that we call the style, and there's a sticky end, oftentimes it's colored, that's called the stigma. Now this is where the pollen is going to fertilize the eggs. What happens is a bee comes flying in here, goes down here, and, it, and the nectar is down, held down here in what's called the nectar cup. As it goes into here, if it's carrying pollen, the pollen will scrape off on this sticky stigma. The pollen then will germinate. It's actually its own plant. It will germinate and carry a sort of a root-like structure, a long tube that grows down the style and into the ovary, and the tube is attracted chemically to one of the eggs. Inside the tube are the sperm, they're just nuclei, and they then will fertilize that egg. And then this ovary, after all the eggs are fertilized, will grow into the fruit. So for example, if this is, a, if this is an apple, then this structure here will grow into the apple. Okay, so where does the pollen come from? Pollen comes from the male parts of the plants, and that's these things. The male parts are, again, a modified leaf into a long tube, which we call the filament. And at the end of the filament is this blob of yellow tissue that produces the pollen, and that's called the anther. And the structure together, the male structure, the anther plus the filament, is called the stamen. 
Okay, so that's a perfect flower. That's not all flowers are perfect. Some flowers only have the have the stamens, and some only have the, the the female structures, which we call the carpel, which includes this entire leaf, the ovary, the style, and the stigma. And this then is the kind of flower that Mendel was working on. And the flower he had was a slightly different shape. The flower he worked on was this. This is a pea plant. This is the flower of a garden pea, the exact same kind of pea that you eat uh, from the store. Now. The types of peas that he got were very different. The pea plants had different characteristics. And that was his whole point. He wanted to see what would happen if you would take things with different characteristics, breed them together, and see what you'd get. So again, <clears throat> this is more close to the actual anatomy of a, of a uh, pea flower, a garden pea flower. You can see the petals are out here like this, and there's the, the female structure. There's the ovary with the eggs in it, and there's the, the, the whole carpal goes up here. There's a stigma. These structures here are the anthers. They're the yellow ones, and then the, the style uh, forming the, uh, the uh, stamens. Now, here's what he wants to do. He wants to see what would happen if you crossed a particular type of pea with another particular type of pea. In this picture, they're showing you pea plant with a yellow flower versus pea plant with a, with a uh, white flower. Okay? Now, this is not the first experiment that he did. I'm going to go through his paper exactly, specifically. But this is just showing you what basically he would do if he wanted to see what would happen if you do this cross. What he did then is he said, okay, I want to take pollen and be sure that the pollen is going to come from where I know it's coming from. The problem is these garden peas are pollinated by bees. They're pollinated by insects. So he's got to control all this. So what he does first is this. Just as the flower opens, just as it matures, he comes in with a paintbrush, paints some of the pollen off of the, uh, of the anthers there, and goes to a different plant. So he paints it off, in this case, the purple. And then he goes to the female structure of the white plant, and he paints the pollen onto the stigma of that. So it looks like, basically, he's an artificial bee. But then he has to keep the real bees out. So what he does is he covers it with a kind of foil that completely covers the, the flower, and so no insects can get into it. And that way he can get completely control the breeding. But also he's got to do something else. And the problem is this. You see what he's done here? He's come in with a pair of scissors, and he's cut those anthers off. And it should be clear why. If this plant has both male and female parts, isn't it possible that it can self-fertilize? The answer is yes. That's another reason why I use this plant. Garden peas will readily self-fertilize. So if he doesn't cut those anthers off after he's painted the pollen, he can't be sure that the plant didn't pollinate itself. So that's what he's got to do. He paints the pollen from one place to another. He cuts the anthers off to where he's putting the pollen, and then he covers that flower with foil. But also there are times when he wants to self-fertilize these plants. To do that is very easy. All you do is you take the foil and put it over the plant flower before it's opened. And then the, fl the flower will open inside that foil cup, and no insects can get to it, and he hasn't done anything to it, so the only thing it can do is self-fertilize. Okay, now, those are his basic methods. What did he get? That's what we need to talk about right now. In Mendel's paper, he started out by exp explaining how he prepared for his experiment. And this is insanely painstaking. It took him years to actually do this preparation step. And the reason he did it was because he needed to be sure that what he was starting with was what we call pure breeding. What that means is this. If you have a situation where something can breed with itself, or two individuals with the same trait will breed with each other, true breeding means that whatever trait they have will always come out in the offspring. So he wants to make sure that that's what he's starting with. So he, what he does is he goes to a seed provider who's a farmer with a big farm and who is, is keeping track of his seeds because of course that's what all agricultural people who have been successful do. They really pay attention to what traits are being passed on from, from parents to offspring and he gets these bags of traits. And the seed producer basically says, okay, this is a pure breeding round seeded one, here's a pure breeding wrinkled one, here's a pure breeding purple flowered, here's and so forth. Now Mendel takes those to thank you, goes back to his garden and he doesn't completely trust what he was told as any good scientist wouldn't so what he does is he takes all the traits that he got and he plants them and as they grow he self-fertilizes them he forces them to self-fertilize and therefore 
if they are not true breeding be, under self-fertilization, they would give plants with different characteristics than, than the plant that they started with. For example, suppose we have a plant, a bunch of seeds that are purple, supposed to, to come from purple flowered plants that are true breeding. Each one of those seeds should grow into a plant then that only ever has purple flowers. So he plants all those to make sure that they do. And then he self-fertilizes them. He forces that generation to self-fertilize. And then he takes those seeds, plants them, and makes sure that those will also be purple. And that's how he, he shows that these things really truly are true breeding. And when I'm talking about when he's doing these experiments, he doesn't plant just 20 seeds. He plants hundreds. And he looks at hundreds of flowers and hundreds of plants. So we're talking about if there were any situations in which those things were not true breeding, then we would get traits other than what the parents were. Now, he did get a few. There were a couple in his paper that he describes that he had to throw out because they weren't true breeding, but the ones that he started with were. So he had tested these over generations to make sure that they were all entirely true breeding. And so he then is ready to start his experiment. So let's take a look at this and apply that. In the first experiment that he describes in his paper, he looks at the seed shape. He says, okay, well, some of these seeds, when you dry them, are round or perfectly round. Some of them, after they're dried, are wrinkled. And the difference is this. The ones that are wrinkled are the sweet peas. Those are the ones you buy in the store, either in cans or frozen. And these, those are the ones you can just eat fresh. And they're nice and sweet, and they've got a lot of sugar. And because they've got a lot of sugar, they swell with water because of osmosis. The sugar goes into solution, dilutes the water inside, and the water then diffuses in and causes the entire seed to swell. So then when you dry it, it shrivels up into a little blob. Now these peas, these round peas, are what are called split peas or soup peas. Those are the peas that are really, really starchy. And starch is not, doesn't go into solution of water. It goes into colloidal suspension. So it doesn't change the osmotic pressure, and so they don't fill with as much water. And so when you dry them, they stay round. So you can think of this as split pea versus sweet pea, but we'll call them round and wrinkled. Okay, so in this case, he started with these guys that were the round variety, that were true breeding. And here's how, again, how he knew. He got a bag from the, from the producer, plants those, they all produce round seeds, takes all those round seeds, plants those, self-fertilizes those plants, they all produce round seeds, and then he actually did it even another generation after that. So he's sure that these are all true breeding round, and he's... By the same reason, sure, these are all true breeding wrinkled. All right, so that's how he starts. Now, if this were generative fluid, I do not want you to predict what you think would happen. That's not what I'm asking. What I'm asking is this. If the generative fluid hypothesis were correct, what would you get? What would you see? Well, if this were generative fluid, this would be producing some kind of round fluid, and this would be producing some kind of wrinkled fluid, or if you wish, starchy versus sweet fluid. And then what you, what you would get is something in between, partially wrinkled, but not as wrinkled as this one, and partially round, but not as round as that one, somewhere in between. Because again, that's what the generative fluid always does. It mixes. When Mendel did this experiment, he got something different than that. What he got was all round. And they were all just as round as the original round parent. Now, the way this is set up, it says the male parents produce round seeds and the female parents produce wrinkled seeds. He did both. He sometimes had the male be wrinkled and the female round. It didn't matter which was the sex. We'll come back to that later. But the point is that all of these round seeds in the, in the offspring of this cross were just as round as the original round parent. They didn't seem to be wrinkled at all. Now, we're going to call this first generation the P generation for parental generation. And the, their offspring we're going to call the F sub 1. And the F1 generation means the first filial generation, the first children. Okay, so here's a question. If this were generative fluid, we would have gotten a different result, but we did get this result. Can we save generative fluid? Is there a way to do that? Now, if you think about that for a moment, you say, well, no, because they don't, they're not mixing. But you've got to keep your head out of the box. Don't let yourself be pinned in. Because they were able to explain it. What they explained was, okay, this is happening. It's still generative fluid, but for some reason, which we don't know yet, this parent gives no fluid. All the fluid only came from the round parent, which is why they look round. This wrinkled parent gave no fluid to that offspring. Okay, that's their explanation, and that's how they explain this kind of a result. Okay, so Mendel does this, and he says, okay, fine. 
Let's do this then. Oh, by the way, before I continue, I want you to realize the number of offspring in this F1 generation is not a few. We're talking thousands. There were thousands, and they were all just as round as this one. Okay, now, what he's going to do is he's going to take these F1s, and he's going to plant them. And when he plants them, he's going to self-fertilize the offspring. So in other words, he takes these seeds, puts them in the ground, they grow into plants, and he self-fertilizes the flowers that are produced on that plant. So then he's going to get the grandchildren of the original parents that he crossed. Okay, now, if the generative fluid explanation is correct, again, I'm not asking you what you think is going to happen. I'm asking if the generative fluid hypothesis is correct and this explanation is correct, that all of the fluid came from this parent, not this parent, then what would we see in the next generation? Okay, because we can save it like this. Well, again, since the wrinkled parent gave no fluid, then the round offspring here in the F1 can only have round fluid. Therefore, if we're mixing round fluid with brown fluid, the offspring would all have to be round. Well, that's not what he got. What he got were these exact numbers, and I'm not making these numbers up. These are the numbers that he, he reports in his paper. He got 5,474 round and 1,850 wrinkled. All right? That's what he got. Now can you save the generative fluid? There's no way. The previous explanation says that these all have to have round fluid. If these are all round fluid, then where did these wrinkles come from? All right, now, there's no way at this point to save generative fluid. You can't do that. It's just there's no way to explain it. All right, interestingly enough, no experiment Mendel did had not been performed. This is not a new experiment. People had already seen this experiment in 1835 when he did it, or 1830s, whenever. So the issue then is why, if they had seen this, why did they not say, okay, the generative fluid is wrong? Well, we see this today all the time. It's the same thing. They said there was a mistake. They explained away. They, they wanted that theory or they supported that theory so strongly that they looked at the data and said, okay, the data don't fit the theory, therefore there must have been a mistake in the experiment. Ladies and gentlemen, 99 times out of 100, when a scientist makes a mistake, that's the mistake they make. Maybe that's an exaggeration, but it's often the, the, the type of mistake that scientists make, is to look at the data and say, no, the data don't fit the theory, so I'm going to throw the data out. That's not the approach. It's also not the approach to say, okay, the data don't fit the theory, but the theory is well supported by other data, but I'm going to throw the theory out. That doesn't work either. What you've got to do is this. If your data don't fit the theory, you've got to figure out why. Because it's possible the data are wrong. It's possible the theory is wrong. You don't know yet. You've got to figure out why that is. Now, what Mendel said was this. He said, look, guys, I don't, at this point, think that generative fluid is, is operating here. And I don't think I made a mistake. And that's where he was... That's where he beat the world. He took this result seriously. He took it seriously enough that he continued. He didn't just look at one trait. He ended up looking at another trait, too. In this case, he was looking at uh, the color of the seeds. So in the second experiments that he reports, he looks at seed color. And peas can come either in yellow pea or green peas. We generally in the stores buy green peas, but yellow is also possible. Yellow seeds can kind of vary from this real dark yellow to a light yellow. The green can vary from this dark green to a light green, but still, you can tell the difference between green and yellow. Now, what he's going to do is he's going to do the exact same experiment that he did before. He's going to take some pollen from this yellow after he's demonstrated that it's true breeding. Again, from generations of planting these yellows, self-fertilizing them, and making sure that they all come out yellow, he then takes some pollen from this one that he knows is a true breeding yellow. He puts it onto the, uh, to the female plant uh, in the that he knows is a true breeding green. He also does it the other way where he takes green pollen, puts it on with yellow, and so forth. And again, what would you see if it's generative fluid? Well, again, if it's generative fluid, you're going to mix yellow fluid with green fluid, so you should get yellowish green. But that's not what he got. What he got was all yellow. And they were all in this range. They were all either, they were none of them were darker than this, none of them were lighter than this, and they were none of them had any green, no green spots, no green modeling, no partial green look. They were just as yellow as the original yellows. Okay, so again, the same sort of explanation. If this were generative fluid, then all of the fluid would have had to have come from the yellow parent, none from the green. So if we self-fertilize these guys, 
what would you expect to see if you self-fertilize and it's generative fluid? Well, if it's generative fluid and you self-fertilize them, then all the offspring would have to be yellow because these guys have nothing but yellow fluid. The F1 has nothing but yellow fluid. So the F2, the next generative grandchildren, would have to be all yellow. But that's not what he saw. What he saw was this, 6,022 yellow, 2,001 green. All right, so again, same sort of thing. He's looking at this. Other people had dismissed this, saying, okay, somebody did a mistake. There was a mistake in my experiment. He said, no, I don't think I made a mistake. I think this is nature talking to me directly. So he's smart, though. He's not going to jump into this and, and say, okay, this is something new and blah, blah, blah. I'm going to throw away the theory, the generative fluid theory. He's got to be careful. He has to look because here's the problem. He knows that the majority of traits don't act like this, and this is the key. The majority of traits do look like generative fluid. If you take a red carnation and you mix it with a, you cross it with a white carnation, you get pink carnations. You take a red snapdragon flower and a white snapdragon flower, you get pink snapdragon flowers. So that kind of, of, of mixing, you look at human beings, you take a tall uh, father and a particularly short mother and the kid tends to be in between. So the point is, that this generative fluid idea actually explains the majority of traits that these people knew. These traits that Mendel is, is, is studying are different. They're very strange and they don't fit the generative fluid pattern. But he's not saying that all traits follow this. He's just saying these traits that I'm studying, these two that I've studied so far do. And in fact, then he looks at a number of other traits as well. In fact, overall, he looks at seven. He looked at spherical versus wrinkled, like I showed you, yellow versus green. And then he looked at flower color, purple versus white. There's a bit of controversy as exactly what he was looking at, flower color or seed coat color, but that's so in the books we tend to talk about it just as flower color because it's easier. So purple flower versus white, same sort of thing. If you take purple and you mix it with white, the offspring and the F1 are all purple. But if you mix those to, together, you self-fertilize these guys, then he got 705 purple and 224 white. This, the inflation of the pod. You see, in some cases, this, the pea pod itself looks like somebody blew in blue air and inflated it, and other ones constricted all around the seeds. You take a plant that's true breeding con, uh, inflated with a plant that's true breeding constricted, the offspring and the F1 are always inflated, but then you self-fertilize these inflated, and you get 882 of the inflated and 299 of the constricted. That's what he got. The flower, the pod color. Here the pod is green or yellow. When you mix those two together, you always get green. So in the offspring are always green, but then the F2, when you self-fertilize these greens, you get 428 green and 152 yellow. And then the flower position, the flower can be either on the end of the uh, stalk, which we call terminal, or it can be in the branch points, which we call axial. You breed axial and terminal together, all the offspring are axial, but you self-fertilize the axial ones, you get 651 axial and 201 terminal. And then these pea plants can be really, really tall, which is like six feet or less than three feet. And that's called dwarf. If you mix tall and dwarf, you always get tall. But if you self-fertilize the tall, you get 787 tall and 277 dwarf. Okay, so he's got seven traits that follow the same basic pattern. Now, the thing you got to realize is this. He had to look hard to find these seven traits. And if you read his paper carefully, you'll see he actually looked at more than just these seven traits. And some of them didn't follow this pattern. And in fact, he knew, just like everybody else, and this is the key, majority of traits do not follow this pattern. And this is why it is that the undergraduates at American universities get the question wrong. What's going to happen if I breed these two things together? If you don't know anything about the genetics of the trait that you're talking about, your best guess is the generative fluid prediction. It's going to be a mixture of the two because the majority of them are like that. But these seven traits are special, and they were the key to understanding modern genetics. So in addition to what I just showed you, Mendel saw something else, and that something is what allowed him to go beyond what other people were willing to do. And the reason is this. Mendel was not just a biologist. He was also a mathematician, a pretty good one as well. And he noticed a pattern in the numbers. And I want to be very careful with this pattern in the numbers here because it's often mistaught. Here is the data that he got from his original study, the very first one that he did, that at least he reported. And if you remember, after he fell self-fertilized these F1s that were all round, he got 5,474 round in the F2 and 1,850 wrinkled also in the F2. I want you to do this. 
take a calculator and take this number, 5,474, and divide by 1,850. Get that number, and let's see what that looks like. Go ahead and do that. Stop the video. Crank that out. Let's come back. So if you did that, then you would have found that the number, if you round correctly to three significant digits, is 2.96 to 1. It's close to 3 to 1, not exactly 3 to 1, but it's pretty close, 2.96 to 1. Now, if we do the same thing for all of these others, all the other seven traits that he looked at, then we get these numbers. For example, yellow versus uh, uh, green. We get 3.01 yellow in the F2 to 1 green in the F2. If we look at the flower color, we get 3.15 purple to 1. We get 2.95 inflated to shriveled. We get 2.82 green pods to yellow pods. And 3.14 axial flowers to tall flowers. And finally, 2.84 uh, tall plants to dwarf plants. So all of these numbers are close to, but not exactly, 3 to 1. This is another mistake that high school students and beginning undergraduates make. If you ask, what will you get in the next generation, they often say you'll get 3 to 1 ratio in the next generation. This is the actual data, guys. This is not theory. This is not something coming out of a textbook. This is what Mendel reported. And notice not one, not one, is 3 to 1. So the correct answer is not that you're going to expect to get exactly a 3 to 1 ratio. But notice it's always close to 3 to 1. Now we have to explain that. And Mendel used that pattern, used that recognition, as part of his explanation. And that's what allowed him to beat the world and to put us onto the track of modern genetics. Now remember, all Mendel did was put us on the right pathway. He's way back at the start. We're 180 years past him. We are much, much farther along than him. But this, these observations are the beginning of modern genetics. And we'll see that in the next lecture.